last week's lesson, we talked about what the church is according to Scripture. And if you listened to that or were there to hear it on Sunday morning, we looked at the various biblical illustrations or metaphors for the church of God, the, the body of Christ. And just by way of reminder, perhaps you recall we talked about the church as described as a family in the Bible, and that emphasizes the relational nature you know, mothers and fathers, sons, daughters, uh, you know, that type of family atmosphere. That's a good picture of the church. We talked about how the church is also described as a body, emphasizing the or organic unity of the body, the in interconnectedness of all the parts. And we compared The Bible compares it to a human body, so that's a great picture as well. The scriptures describe the church as a temple, emphasizing the holiness of the body of Christ. Uh, the church is designed to be uh, a holy thing. It's set apart for God's purposes. The church is described as a bride and uh, speaking there of the commitment that the people of God make to their Lord. And then finally we've pictured the church as the scriptures do as an army emphasizing the mission. <clears throat> We're called out by God from the world for a purpose, and that is to interact with the world, share the gospel, and uh, we mobilize as an army does to be the, the hands and feet and, and uh, the working place of God in the world. So those are all biblical pictures of what the church is. Beginning this morning, in this particular lesson, we're going to turn our attention to some of the things the church isn't. Now, obviously, we're not going to go to scriptures and uh, you know, you won't find statements like, well, the church is not this or the church is not that. But we gather principles in our study of the, the scriptures to understand that there are certain things that God, you know, doesn't want the church to be. As you study the Bible, it becomes clear that some illustrations or metaphors would not be appropriate as you consider the body of Christ. <clears throat> we will look at just one this morning and there'll be, Lord willing, others to come consider this, but one ill-fitting picture of the church would be that of a museum. I don't believe the church is intended to be a mu museum. Now, most of you know what I'm talking about when I uh, say, what is a museum? You've probably been to one. You've probably been to several in your life. Uh, most people like museums. There's different museums for different things. But a museum, of course, is a place where you go to see relics of the past, Right. Uh, if you're into natural history, there are a lot of good museums throughout the world that have, you know, uh, scale models of, of dinosaurs. They dig up the bones and kind of hook them together so you can see at least the, the structural uh, outline of a Tyrannosaurus rex, things like that. Massive animals. And perhaps that's your cup of tea as far as museums go. But those are relics of the past. Rocks and and uh, things like that, fossils. So uh, that's one facet of a museum. A museum, of course, is a place where the past is preserved and honored, and we ought to do those kind of things, right? A place, it's a place where history is rehearsed, and there's a, you know, museums have their place in, in any culture. I believe it's a good thing to be able to see relics of the past and preserve and honor certain things and to rehearse history. Uh, George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are doomed or condemned to repeat it. So that's the benefit of having historical markers and historical or places to go where you can see history. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't no good to try to erase it. It, it happens. So, you know, that's, that's the essence of a museum, though. And in their place, they're good things. And certainly, of course, we could say that the people of God can, of course, benefit from remembering their own history. We're not saying that when we, or when we say the church shouldn't be a museum, we're not saying there are, aren't things we ought to remember. The Bible is full of admonitions from God through his son Jesus or through inspired men and women that uh, tell us to remember certain things, right? That God instituted in the Old Covenant certain sacrifices and certain feasts to help 
the children of Israel remember things. Passover is one of the primary ones of those. So we're called to remember, and it's good to remember history. In the New Testament, places like, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 and Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it just says things that happened before are written for our instruction so that we could have hope. We go back and read those old Bible stories, not necessarily to mimic everything they did in the same way and for the same purpose, but we learn lessons from the victories and the, and the defeats of, of people who've gone before us. As modern Christians, of course, we stand on the shoulders of great men and women who have forged a path in their own day and time. So when, so when we say the church is not to be a museum, we're not saying there, again, that we just discard the memory of, of all those who've worked hard in the past to, to do the will of God. We stand on their shoulders, figuratively speaking. Uh, we, we benefit from their work. The Bible rehearses the history of God's work in the world as well as in the church, and we're called again to learn from that past. But that doesn't mean, as far as, as I understand things, the church is to live in the past. Yes, we remember the past. We learn from it. But I would affirm that God never intends for the church to live in the, in the past. A museum, of course, is a nice place to visit, isn't it? We talked about that a moment ago. Most people love to go to a museum. Nice place to visit, but it's not a great place to live. I suppose if it's got a good uh, cafeteria and things like that, maybe you could get along there for a while, but my guess is most people wouldn't choose to live in a museum day to day. The older we get in the faith, the more nostalgic we tend to become. And that's just kind of human nature, isn't it? Seems like the older we get, even in, you know, we're not even in a non spiritual connection, uh, we start to talk about the good old days, right? Nostalgia. Nothing wrong with that necessarily. That happens again the older we get, the greater the temptation comes to live in the past. And that becomes perhaps more of a problem to rehearse the glory of the days gone by. Now, again, nothing wrong with nostalgia in and of itself. But if someone is nostalgic for the past that they try to start living in it, then perhaps a greater problem comes. This We see evidence of this nostalgia even in the church. You know, maybe you've heard people say, well, I remember when... Well, let's just fill in a few of those blanks. I remember when the church used to have one or two week long gospel meetings. I remember when we used to have cottage meetings and door knocking campaigns and joy buses, etc. Or I remember that we were the fastest growing religious group in the United States. Those are nostalgic statements and nothing wrong with uh, that in and of itself. Those things uh, were effective in their day and time, but perhaps not so much today. I remember when I used to attend debates and even folks that weren't members of the church would come and, and listen. Those kind of things betray this nostalgia on the part of, of church members. But I would remind us all that our world and our culture have changed in many respects. That list of things that I you know, you hear church members say, well, I remember when it was like this, and I remember when it was like that. The world is, has grown beyond those type of things in many ways. Our culture, our world has changed. Granted, many of those changes haven't been for the good. We can all affirm that. We can all remember things that uh, are different now that we wish were like they were. So some of the changes haven't been good, some have, but it's what we have to work with, isn't it? You know, just to long for the good old days doesn't change the world we're living in. It's the world and culture we have, like it or not. You know, we can bemoan what's become of the world around us and in our, in our culture, but what does that accomplish? Nothing, especially as far as the church is concerned. The question is, Will the modern church learn to adapt itself to connect with our modern world and culture? The world and culture has changed, and nothing we can do to stop that. 
We do have something to say about the church, though, don't we? But will the church learn to adapt itself to, the, to connect with our modern world, or will we become a museum celebrating days gone by? I notice carefully that I didn't say, you know, the church needs to conform to the world around it or cave in to the world around it. I'm not affirming that in any way, shape, or form. We're told in places like Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2, right in that region, that or to be transformed, not to be conformed to the world. So we're not talking about that at all. So, but I think there are ways the church can adapt its in its methods to perhaps be effective even in a changing world. The reality is, of course, that the way the church did things 50 or 60 years ago may not work as well today. Some things might, but there are some practices that were very effective in, in that time frame that perhaps aren't nearly as effective as they were. So for us, we need to make a decision. Do we choose to live in the past as a church or are we going to live in the present? Most of us, of course, have learned to live in the present in every other area of life, haven't we? Of course we have. I just think, in, here's a few examples. How about household appliances? You know, an icebox was cutting-edge technology in its day, wasn't it? Maybe some of you are old enough to remember where maybe granddad or maybe mom or dad had an icebox. That was amazing in its time. But my guess is nobody's using an icebox yet today, right? We have modern refrigerators, and we're, we're glad we do. Uh, so, you know, we've learned to live in that present reality. Same thing is true with vehicles, right? Uh, the Model A was a technological marvel in its day compared to horse and buggy. But, you know, and, uh, you know, I like mechanical type things. And, you know, sometimes I long for the good old days when things weren't quite as complex as they are today with computers and all kinds of things that make a car run. But on the other hand, it's pretty nice to go out on a cold morning and hit that key and have a car fire right up and not spend 15 or 10 or 15 minutes uh, flooding itself out before it finally is warm enough to run. Uh, we, you know, we, we like to get in a car where we can push a button and, and the climate becomes instantly cool or instantly warm. Uh, again, we've learned to adapt in vehicular matters. Same thing is true with electronics, right? We all grew up, or most of us, in the day when you had the rotary telephones, and they worked fine. But we've grown kind of used to adapting to a world where we, you know, you don't have to be run for the phone to answer it. Well, there's good and bad that comes with that. But the point of all these illustrations is the fact that we, we've learned in every area of life to, to live in the present. To not do that, well, you know, you can look as far as the example of the Amish, right? You know, they're looked come now as a, as a caricature of, of still doing things in a way that were done 50, 100 years ago, but that, that's an oddity. Well, does Jesus, of course, have anything to say about the temptation of the church becoming a museum? Not directly, but I think uh, we can look at a section of Scripture today that can give us some insight into perhaps uh, what you know, he would say about something like that. Would Jesus be in favor of a church being locked in the past, being locked into doing things the way they were always done, right? It worked then, so it ought to work today. You know, would, would Jesus be in favor of the church being pictured as a museum? I don't think so, and I think that way because of texts like uh, Luke chapter 5. You can be opening your Bibles there to Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 38. We're going to take a look at that. But let me remind you that Jesus lived and ministered in, a, in the midst of one of the greatest culture shocks that Jews had ever experienced. Probably, you know, as much change as we think we're living in today, spiritually speaking, for the work of God in the first century, the inclusion of the Gentiles into the family of God that the Jews viewed themselves as God's exclusive people for so long, Jesus uh, came to earth right smack dab in the middle of that culture shock. And it was a shock 
in its day to the people involved. And Jesus you know, butted heads with many among his fellow Jews who were resisting that change. The Jews had got used to the way things had always been, and they saw no reason to change. And along comes Jesus and starts talking about some things that were, were uh, causing trouble for their comfort zone. Let's read. Let me read uh, Luke chapter 5 and verses 33 through the end of the chapter in verse 39. We'll come back and talk about it a little bit. <clears throat> So as they said to him, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink, speaking of Jesus' disciples. So here they're taking Jesus to task over this. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come. When the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old piece of cloth, or puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts, a new, puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled out, and the skins will be ruined but new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking the old wine wishes for new, for he says the old is good enough. As you listen to me read that, perhaps you begin to pick up on some things that will be pertinent for our discussion as far as the church being viewed as a museum or the temptation for the church to become a museum in its own day and time. Again, the issue here, that Jesus is dealing with, bottom line is overdoing things differently, right? Did you catch that in verse 33? Here you've got this group coming to Jesus, and they say, well, the disciples of John do it this way. They often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same. So, And what's being implied? Well, everybody ought to do it that way, and everybody ought to keep doing it that way. But the problem was, he said, they said, your disciples eat and drink. Your disciples are doing things differently. And uh, you might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, again, there's resistance to doing things differently. So that's the issue here in this context. In the next few verses, Jesus defends his disciples by noting that they were acting in ways appropriate to the time. So he says, you know, listen to me for just a moment. You think... You know, you pointed out, yes, they are doing some things differently, but there's a reason for that. Again, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said to them, You cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? That's not the purpose of, you know, a, a wedding gathering. It's not a time for, for fasting, which would imply, of course, a sorrow over something or grief. That's not the time. The days will come, Jesus says, verse 35, when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. And of course, Jesus is using a metaphor here, but he's ultimately talking about you know, himself being the, the bridegroom of the bride and the disciples, of course, being part of the, the bride. But anyway, the days are going to come. Jesus will be crucified and, and go back to the Father. There will be some mourning associated with that. But while Jesus is with him, this isn't the time. So, of course, there's, uh, you know, there's reasons why they were acting this way. It was what they were doing was appropriate for the times, even though it was different than what his detractors were, were looking at. Jesus then gives two examples of the wisdom of adapting to changing circumstances. A couple of, uh, again, mental pictures that Jesus uses to make his point. He was fond of doing that, and that's why he was such a, a great teacher. Example number one is this idea of putting a, a new cloth patch on an old garment. Number two is going to be putting new wine into old wineskins. In verse 36, he was telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. So you start matching new with old and, you know, you wash that garment and, and things are going to start to tear. And, you know, the, the old garment has had all the, you know, 
well, if it's going to shrink, it's done that already. But the new may have to go through that process anyway. Uh, that's not going to work real well. Uh, you know, you need to find a different way to do that. Same thing is true with the wine skins. Uh, an old wine skin was an animal skin, you know, shaped to to hold wine, and over time it became hard. When you put new wine into old wine skins, and what's going to happen? It, as the fermenting process goes on, the pressure begins to build. And when that happens, that's why you put new wine into new wine skins, because they're flexible enough to expand with the fermentation. Old wine skins are going to take that pressure and, and explode or, or break or tear. Uh, so again, you know, I need to find a way uh, to handle it the best for the circumstances. That's the point. So it's wise in both cases to adapt to the changing circumstances. In verse 38, Jesus says, you know, this is, this is why you need to adapt in this case. He notes the necessity of adaptation. The new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. It's the only way it's going to work right. And again, I think the picture here fits pretty well with what we're talking about, the church becoming a museum. Things may have worked in the past that we need to find ways to adapt for them to work now. And then finally, he notes in verse 39, the difficulty associated with adaptation. Jesus says it's necessary. You know, it's, it's just the reality of life. You need to learn to adapt if you're going to live in changing times. But he says the reality is that, you know, there's difficulties associated with that. Jesus knows that. He's not trying to hide from that. In verse 39, he says, And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new, for he says the old is good enough. And that's the same thing we can see happening in churches, right? The old way was good enough for me. And even if it doesn't work as well today, we need to keep doing it the old way. We need to keep putting that new wine in. We'll take this new culture, this new world we live in, and we'll continue to put it in that old wineskin, come what may. Well, sometimes, though, we need to realize, you know, it's just kind of human nature. We get used to the old wine, and that's what we want, right? I'm not wishing for new. Well, we may not wish for a new world or a new culture in many ways, spiritually speaking, but it is, again, the reality. That's where we are at. The temptation, of course, for the church to become a museum is strong. Again, it's human nature to be nostalgic and, you know, we get used to doing things a certain way and we resist change in that way. That's why the temptation for the church as the spiritual body of Christ is tempted very strongly to, uh, you know, wade into that mindset. Just keep things the way they are. Well, how do we, how do we resist becoming fossilized. I'll say it that way. I've been talking about the example of museum and a lot of times the museums have fossils in them. Well, the church can become fossilized when it resists adaptation to the world in which it lives. And again, not talking about conforming, not talking about caving in, just adapting to, to new circumstances. How do we resist becoming fossilized? Let me give you three suggestions you can think about. First of all, I would affirm, again, and I think this is what Jesus is saying there in, in uh, Luke chapter 5, we need to remain open to new methods without surrendering the mission. Let me say it again. We need to remain open to new methods without surrendering the mission. The mission res remains the same for the church. Again, we're to go into all the world and, and, and share the kingdom of God, the gospel, right? That's unchanging. Our call from God doesn't change in our world, but perhaps the methods need to. And we need to remain open to those new methods while remaining firm on what God calls us to do. Part of that is just carefully learning to distinguish between what is changeable and what is unchangeable. You know, that's a $64,000 question, isn't it? That's why you, know, you got a debate raging within religious circles of, you'll hear the name, you know, the title change agent being thrown around <clears throat> uh, and you know people being labeled that way well we need to rather than maybe calling names we just need to sit down with our scriptures and find out what truly is unchangeable and what can be adapted in a, in a modern day setting and there is a difference everything uh, 
isn't changeable and everything isn't unchangeable and it takes wisdom. So that's why we need to remain open to new methods without surrendering what's our mission, what is unchangeable. Secondly, I would recommend that we learn as we try to navigate these waters to honor the past, but not enshrine it. And there's a difference, right? We can honor the past. We're, I'm not saying in this lesson that we just jettison everything the church has been, that we look down on everything earlier Christians did in different cultures and different times. I'm not saying we can't still honor that. We should. We're to give honor to whom honor is due. And a lot of uh, honor goes to men and women of the church over centuries who have been faithful and have uh, worked to serve God in their day and time. So we can honor that, but we don't enshrine it like a museum would do. You know, we don't, and, and enshrining would just mean, again, kind of hardening into a way of saying, well, those, that old garment's fine, and we need to stay with it. That old wineskin is fine. We need to, to keep using that. Well, there's a place for a way to use an old wineskin, but it isn't with new wine. Uh, enshrining our past is where it becomes a problem. Then finally, I would recommend for all of us to endeavor to be a catalyst instead of a curator. You know what a museum curator is, right? They're the person who takes care of a museum. It takes care of the exhibits the things that have been enshrined. And there's a, there's a, quite a lot of curators in the church, the men and women who are fine with the way things were and fight any resistance, uh, any resistance to those old ways. Again, not necessarily bad in of themselves, but maybe it's things that don't work anymore. But a curator is going to say, well, hold on. You know, I'm here to protect the old thing. Uh, I think it's far better in the church to be a catalyst of course, a catalyst is something that you add to a mixture to, to cause a change. And I'm speaking here of a good thing in our culture and time, good ways of, of reacting to things around us. I think it's far better for us to be that kind of person rather than a curator. Yes, we need to remember the past. We can honor it and learn from it, but we need to sit down and and decide, you know what, this is the world we're living in. How can the church of God, under the, the uh, uh, leadership, the headship of Christ, understanding that there are some things that are timeless, there are some principles like the gospel that will never change, regardless of what the world has been or what it becomes, we need to understand very carefully those things. But on the other hand, we need to, to think about uh, how perhaps we can best adapt our mission to the world we live in. And that's what I'm saying. And the, a catalyst would be that person who says, let's talk about those things. And let's find ways that are, are effective today to the generation of people that we're talking to, that we live among. Endeavor to be that catalyst instead of the curator who perhaps walks around in the church and dusts off those those old exhibits, those old ways, and says, this is the way it's always got to be done. We've done it that way for so long, and, and we never want to do it another way. So it's better to be perhaps that person that says, let's find out the difference between what is changeable and what is unchangeable, and let's be effective for Christ. So the church, I don't believe, was ever intended by God to be this museum. And I want you to think about that carefully as is perhaps you digest what we've talked about today. Lord willing, in the next few lessons, we'll talk about other illustrations that show that the, the church wasn't really designed to be this or that. You can hopefully look forward to that. Uh, I want to pray that you'll pray that you'll have a blessed week. Uh, again, look through some of this again. Think about it. If you've got some comments or questions, I welcome anyone's input on this. I realize in this format, it's difficult to have a a give and take. That's what we're kind of we have at this particular time. But uh, feel free to comment on the video. There should be a place below where you can do that. Send me an email. If you're part of our local church, you know what that is. Uh, anyway, don't be afraid to ask a question or a comment. Uh, we we learn from one another. And we want to continue to do that. But I think there's some important things Jesus is trying to say here to us about the church not being.
a museum. God bless, and I pray that as you go into the week ahead that there'll be opportunities for you to interact with a, a changing world and culture where you can be a, make a difference for God. Have a great week.